All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Natalie Copeland, and I am the coordinator for the D2ME Diabetes Support Group. And I want to welcome you all to our presentation this evening, which is uh, Diabetes and the Science of Sleep. So Roberta Jupp, uh, who works at Lexington Medical Center, um, is going to talk to us about the importance of sleep when you have diabetes. Hopefully you will find this presentation beneficial to you. And um, I'm going to let Roberta get started and she will let you know um, whether you can ask questions as we go along. I know sometimes she does like a lot of participation. So um, I'll let her handle that bit. And just to let you know, we are recording. Um, so this will be posted online a little later in case you would like to revisit this video. And right now I will turn it over to Roberta. Hi, everyone. You can unmute and talk. How are y'all doing? All right, good. Um, can you see the participant screen on my screen? Or, do, or could you just see in the uh, PowerPoint? I'm just seeing the PowerPoint. Okay, you can't see uh, your picture or my picture or the participants? No, ma'am. Okay, okay, good. All right. I have mine set up so that I can see people, but yours is just showing the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we've got a lot of slides to show, and uh, <clears throat> I've been doing this study on sleep and thought that I would share it with you all because uh, it's amazing how sleep or the lack of it or the lack of proper sleep really affects us. So um, do you all have any questions before we get started? Nope. Everybody's quiet. Okay. Let's see if I can get this to go. So here's the references for the presentation. And as Natalie said, it will be posted so you can check out the references. Um, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, PhD in neurophysiology. He's a director of the Human Sleep Science Center at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Depression, The Way Out by Dr. Neil Nedley. The Importance of Sleep and Self-Heal by Design by Barbara O'Neill and sleepfoundation.org. So those are the references you can refer to. Um, and I may need to if you have some in-depth questions for me. So the first question is, are sleep disorders a new phenomenon or have we have people had sleep disorders for hundreds of years? What do you think? As to why people are having trouble sleeping, do you think that sleep disorders are new or do you think that that they have been going on for years and years? I think going on for years and years. Well, it's a relatively new thing because um, before the invention of electricity and electric lights, people usually went to bed when the sun went down. And if they had candlelight, it really wasn't that effective in doing what they wanted to do. You can't you know, stay up and cook a whole meal after the sun goes down if you just have a candle. So um, we really didn't see a lot of sleep disorders until after the invention of electricity. So why are people having so much uh, trouble with sleep today? Well, the first thing we, we'd like to talk about is the pineal gland. And it's a little gland that's in the center of our brain, about the size of a macadamia nut. And it's very important because it releases four hormones every night, but only during certain hours. So in the winter time, the pineal gland makes these, um, these hormones between 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. And in the summertime, between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. And light and dark signals will stimulate the release of the hormones. So let's say you're used to going to bed at midnight and it's winter time. And um, can you see my cursor here when I'm moving it around on your screen? Okay. So let's say we go to bed at midnight. How many hours are we getting the benefit of the hormones? Only two hours, right? And in the summertime, we're only getting about three hours worth of benefit. 
So when we go to sleep too late, we're actually missing out on these hormones that we're going to talk about. The first one is called melatonin. I'm sure that you've heard of that. And that is our nighttime fix and rejuvenate hormone. So it affects our, our sleep and wake cycle. We call that circadian rhythm. If we're female, it affects our female hormones and it helps prevent um, neurodegenerative disease, nerve um, disease in our brain. So that one's important, right? Um, the second one is serotonin and that's our feel good mood hormone. So if we're not having enough serotonin released, then we, that could lead to our depression, right? So we want plenty of serotonin. And again, we're missing out on it if we don't get sleep at the right time. The third one you may not have heard about. I have I did not hear about it until I started studying. It's called arginine vasotocin. And it's a natural painkiller. So when we release this, when the pineal gland releases this, it helps us, it's a natural painkiller. So it helps us go into a very deep sleep. But when our brain uses this vasotocin, it leaves a waste product and our body has to get rid of that waste or more vasotocin won't be released the next night. So the best way that we can get rid of the waste of this hormone is by exercise. So the earlier we go to sleep, the better chance we have we will have of going into a deep sleep. The last chance to call during this program for a free fifty dollar Are they making an announcement? Sorry. Somebody have their um somebody else somebody else have another uh program playing? Jane and Pat, do you have another program playing? Because you're not muted. Um, it might be my TV. <laughs> okay, okay. If you turn that off, thank you. Okay, I'll go to another room. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. That's okay. So, um, so that was the third hormone, the arginine vasotocin. And then the last one is called epithalamin, and it helps us to increase our learning capacity, and it helps us to retain things that we are learning. Did you know <clears throat> that our brains were created to learn new things even up until old age? So a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm, there's no I'm in a webinar. Huh? Pat, is that you? Is that Jane? me what? No, that looks like Jane. Okay, Jane, did you have a question? Jane? Oh, she muted. Okay. Well, she unmuted. Okay. So um, did you know that we could learn things all the way up way into old age? So if we ever are tempted to, you know, if we want to learn something and we're tempted to think, oh, you know, I won't be able to learn that because I'm getting older. Well, that's not true. We could always learn. Our brain has a learning capacity. So these are the four pineal gland hormones <clears throat> that are released in the winter between nine and two and in the summer between 10 and three. So we'd like to make use of all of those as much as possible. Would you agree? Okay. Have you heard about REM sleep? Have you heard that term, REM? Okay. So this type of sleep is regulated by the brain stem and that's in the back of our brain, okay? And this is the time of sleep that we dream. And it's a time that we're very creative or invent things in our brain. Um, it helps us to confirm the things that we experience during the day that have to do with time and space and help us to put things into context. And it also helps us to file and store our emotional memories of the day. So if we had some wonderful things happen, it goes into the wonderful file. If we had some negative things happen, it goes into the negative file. And Dr. Matthew Walker, because of his uh, research into sleep, he said it's almost as if sleep has an intelligence. So this is REM sleep. And then the other type of sleep that we have is non-REM or non-rapid eye movement. So that's called NREM. This is regulated by our higher brain centers, our, our top of our brain that involves um, morality and scientific things and our ability to think through things and um, uh, cognitive types of things. So this is when our brain's courier service is working. So the, the, the couriers take all of the day's memories and as, as we 
through the day and as we start to learn it's stored in short-term memory but while we sleep all of these files are taken from the short-term memory and filed up into the higher areas of the brain for storage for later so let's say you're studying for an exam you're a student uh, when you're studying for the exam all of that goes into short-term memory but then when you go to sleep it's transferred into the cortex area of the brain so if you are sleeping properly when you're trying to take a test then all of those files will be available to you because they're stored properly also during non-REM sleep the brain has a cleaning service have you ever heard of the glymphatic system most of us have heard of the lymphatic system, but the glymphatic system is a way for our brain to clean out any byproducts of the things that our nerves do during the day. So as our nerves are firing through the day throughout our brain, there are some waste products that are given off. So the glymphatic system helps to clean out all of those byproducts of the glucose and oxygen combustion and, and helps to just clear the brain of all of those things. So if we don't get enough non-REM sleep, then we just have this backup of waste and storage. The courier service can't work properly and our brains kind of have a lot of trash left in them because they're not able to clean out the, the byproducts of the glucose and oxygen during the day. And so that's one reason why the right amount of REM and non-REM sleep are important. So as we sleep, we have these cycles of sleep. And a cycle of sleep is about 90 minutes. And the first cycle, the non-REM, takes up 80% of the time. So that's what we were talking about. Our body is cleaning out all the waste products. It's trying to file and store everything that we learn through the day. And the dreaming creative part, the REM, is only 20%. 20%. So this is the first cycle, first hour and a half of sleep is the first part of the night that most of our brain cleaning happens. But as you notice in the second, third, fourth, and fifth cycle, we have less non-REM and we have more creative um, and, uh, and dreaming, okay? And so when we're in REM sleep, then it's easier, if we wake up from REM sleep, it's easier for us to remember a dream. And as we get closer to morning, after we go through four and five cycles, then um, we, we tend to dream more. So did you ever notice, like if you slept a really long time, like maybe eight or nine or 10 hours, that the last hour or so, it just feels like you're just dreaming and you might be dreaming that you're awake. It's just because our body has finished with the non-REM cycle and we're in our REM cycle. And so we dream more and we just are, are more creative and we start dreaming things that are imaginative unless we have pizza the night before then your stomach tries to get back at you and gives you some wild dreams <laughs> so that's the REM and the non-REM sleep and why it's so important to have uh, the right amounts of each type of these so we can dream we can uh, be creative but we can also clean out the waste products and um, and be able to to you know, file everything properly. So any questions about REM and non-REM sleep? Does it make sense so far? Sandy, you're the only one that I can see you. So <laughs> Miss Pat and Miss Jane are not having their um, their picture up. So I can't see whether they're, they have a, qu quiz a question mark on their face. So, okay. So it's clear, Sandy. All right. Thank you for, for letting us see you. All right, so how long should we actually sleep? Well, eight hours of sleep each night is non-negotiable, according to Dr. Matthew Walker. It's our biological necessity, our body's life support system. We may feel fine after six hours of sleep, but um, if we don't clean out all those waste products, then some of those waste products are what we call B amyloids, and it could start collecting and uh, start to form some plaque seen in Alzheimer's patients. So one way that we can avoid Alzheimer's disease is to make sure to get eight hours of sleep every night. So um, if we get that sleep, our, that our brain is cleaned, all of the waste products are out, and all of the memories are stored where they're supposed to be. So is everybody getting eight hours of sleep? Nope. How about you? How about you, Natalie? 
I used to get like eight, nine hours of sleep, but um, a lot of times now if I get maybe six, seven, that's about as good as I can get. And then I have some days where I can't fall asleep to three o'clock in the morning and, and the clock goes off at 6.30. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. But as we get older, for a lot of us, it's really hard to sleep continuously for eight hours because it's more easy to wake up. And we'll talk about that. So <clears throat> let it be a good um, goal for you to try to get eight hours of sleep as much as possible because we definitely don't want um, those plaques building up in our brain. We want to avoid Alzheimer's. So what happens when we don't get enough sleep? Well, you look like this gentleman in the picture. Um, so again, we don't get the pineal glands hormones, those four hormones that are beneficial for us. It decreases our brain's cleaning function. Our short-term memory is not completely emptied. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I just keep forgetting a lot of things. <clears throat> and as I get older, it's worse. Well, if we don't sleep for eight hours, then we don't have our short-term memory cleared out. So there's not enough room for new memories to come in. So we've got to clear that out in order to, to let the memories be stored the next day. Um, there's a 40% deficit in the ability of the brain to make new, does it say memories, make new memories, and it decreases the learning capability of students. And how many students do we know, especially college students, that don't get the proper sleep? <clears throat> you know, we don't, they don't get enough, and then they don't do well on exams, and, and it's hard, okay? So eight hours of sleep per night can retain almost double the consolidation or confirmation compared to six hours of sleep. So eight hours of sleep definitely makes us more functional. <clears throat> In males, it decreases their testosterone and it also negatively affects the hormone activity of females. And we saw that when we talked about melatonin, how, how that affects the female hormones. So we definitely don't wanna be sleep deprived. Do you think that daylight savings time changes can affect our bodies and our minds? Yes. You think so? How about you, Miss Jane? What do you think? Natalie, what do you think? I agree. Yes, I yeah. also agree. I agree too. Well, in the spring, when we lose an hour, there's a what percent increase in heart attacks the following day? 24%. 24% increase in heart attacks. And in the fall, when we gain an hour, there's a what decrease in heart attacks? I can believe it. 24%. Decrease. <laughs> and so the same profile applies to car crashes, suicide rates, and other accidents. So when we take that hour away, it definitely has a <clears throat> negative impact on our health. When we gain that hour, we get that back, right? So um, I hope that they stabilize it. I think they should just, um, if I were a queen, I would just say, just change it a half an hour and leave it. <laughs> I agree. But there's a huge, a huge effect on our body with daylight savings time. So how do you think sleep deprivation affects our immune system? You think it affects it? Sandy's nodding. Okay. Well, it does. Look, look at this. Our natural killer cells seek out and eliminate our dangerous elements, our, our natural killer cells. We want them to work properly. Sleep reduction to only four hours in one single night can reduce the natural killer cell activity by up to how much? 70%. 70%. There's a direct 70. and 70. I'm sorry. That's okay. There's a direct <laughs> and strong link between short sleep duration and a risk of different types of cancer, including bowel, prostate, and breast cancer. According to the World Health Organization, people who work nighttime shifts, that's a probable carcinogen for them, the, the not just a change in that shift. Okay. Short sleep equals shorter life. Sleep loss affects every aspect of our physiology. And people with diabetes, their immune systems are challenged anyway, right? You know, they they sometimes face 
lowered immune function just because they have diabetes. So if the blood sugars are out of control and then you're losing sleep, that's a real hit on the immune system. So it makes people with diabetes more, more um, susceptible to things like cold and flu and COVID and things like that. So our immune system takes a hit when we don't get enough sleep. How does the, here, so here we go into the diabetes aspect of it. So how does our quality and quantity of sleep affect our blood sugar levels? You think there's a link there, a relationship there? Yeah, that's, yes, why, we're, so. that's why we're having this, right? Okay, so... Um, it's estimated that one in two people with type two diabetes have sleep problems due to unstable blood sugar levels and diabetes related symptoms. So if we have high blood sugars or low blood sugars through the night, that definitely makes us tired the next day, right? Or it might wake people up and they can't get back to sleep if their blood sugars are too high or too low. Um, it takes a long time to recover from hypoglycemia and that could keep you awake longer during the night. Uh, people um, are stressed about their diabetes, especially if they're on medications that could, could cause a hypoglycemic event. They're worried about that. And it might cause stress or depression, which also could lead to insomnia. When the blood sugar levels are high, what do the kidneys do? Got to go to the bathroom, right? And so you can't sleep because you're having to go to the bathroom and urinate all of that extra sugar out. And if we also, if we have hyperglycemia, that may also cause headaches, increase our thirst and tiredness that could interfere with falling asleep. So it's almost like a vicious cycle. If we're stressed and worried about the diabetes, we don't get enough sleep. If we don't get enough sleep, it affects our blood sugars. <clears throat> So if we delay our meals and we take the wrong balance of diabetes medication, this can lead to low blood sugar levels at night. And again, you know, it wakes you up. You have a nightmare, you might break out in a sweat or be confused. So getting poor sleep or less restorative, which is deep sleep, has been linked to higher blood sugar. So we don't get enough sleep, the blood sugars go high. If the blood sugars go high, it could cause insomnia. It's that vicious cycle that we talked about. So researchers believe that sleep restriction may affect our blood sugar levels uh, because of the effects on insulin, cortisol, and oxidative stress. So if we have this vicious cycle going on, high blood sugars interfering with sleep and then lack of sleep causing the, the high or low blood sugars, what is the solution? Well, the solution would be to try to control the blood sugars first with as much knowledge as we have. Once the blood sugars are controlled, hopefully the person would be able to get enough sleep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So uh, for someone that has diabetes or someone that doesn't have diabetes, if, if they're sleep deprived, it could also increase the risk of insulin resistance. So you don't want insulin resistance leading to the diagnosis of diabetes and you don't, if you have diabetes, you don't want even more insulin resistance. When we don't sleep enough, this raises our levels of ghrelin and this makes us feel hungry. I like to, yeah, leptin makes us feel full. So ghrelin, I like to think of as greedy gremlins, starting with a G. <laughs> that makes us <laughs> want to eat too much, right? And decreases the levels of leptin that make us, make us feel like we were satisfied. So we don't get enough sleep, we want to eat more. And do we want to eat more broccoli? When we're sleep deprived, do we want to eat more broccoli? No, we want to eat sugary things, right? Ice cream or, you know, comfort foods. So if we don't get enough sleep, our body tries to compensate and ask for more energy, which we, we probably don't need, lots of calories from sugar. And that could lead to weight gain and that could lead to blood sugars being uh, more uncontrolled. Sleep deprivation is also linked with restless leg syndrome and obstructive sleep apnea. And sometimes people just blame that on the diabetes or some other neurological cause, but it could be directly related to not getting enough sleep. So those are the main relationships between not getting the right amount or type of sleep 
and diabetes. So any question about that? Because that's the main focus of this talk is, is how diabetes and sleep are related. So any questions on that? Feel free to unmute yourselves if you have a question or would like to comment. Yeah. I guess we're making, I guess it's making a lot of sense. <laughs> it is actually. <laughs> okay. Is there a link between sleep deprivation and depression? Well, we kind of hinted at that before. And this is according to Dr. Neil Nedley's book, Depression the Way Out. Up to 80% of depressed people experience a disrupted circadian rhythms or sleep cycle. Most people that are depressed go to sleep, go to bed very late. They're exposed to blue light. We're going to talk about that. And they also miss early morning sun exposure. If we continually lack our adequate sleep, if we have less than six hours a night, it could lead to depression and other mental disorders. So again, it's a vicious cycle. Lack of sleep can cause depression. Depression can cause lack of sleep. And you definitely, if you feel like you're having that vicious cycle, you definitely want to talk to the provider. So that way you can try to get out of that vicious cycle. Um, one reason why we may be depressed is because we talked about the pineal gland releasing serotonin, which is our feel happy hormone. So one thing a person could do is go to bed on time, nine o'clock in the winter, at least 10 o'clock in the summer. And that way our pineal gland can make more serotonin and help us to uh, and help us to get out of that that depression and sleep lack um, cycle. Okay, too much sleep every night could also contribute to depression and mental disorders as well. And that surprised me because if I don't have to get up, I'll sleep nine hours. I'll sleep ten hours. Sometimes it feels good to catch up, but I think they mean you know on a regular basis. So too much sleep can can cause trouble as well. So there's definitely a link between depression and sleep. Exercise and sleep, physical activity can help us complete our eight hour sleep cycle. We're tired, so we're gonna be sleeping more. Uh, sometimes if we sit at a desk all day, we don't really get a whole lot of activity. We're not really that tired. I mean, you're not physically tired. But if we exercise and we have that physical tiredness, sometimes it helps us to get the sleep that we need. If the best time to exercise would be in the morning, and especially when the sunshine and the fresh air is, is there. And right now it's a time of year where we can really enjoy those early morning walks because it's not so hot. <laughs> um, we don't want to do a lot of strenuous exercise before bed. It would keep us awake. Uh, but a leisurely walk after our meal in the evening would be great. As we age, our learning and memory uh, abilities begin to decline. And so it also makes us hard to achieve our eight hours, like we mentioned before. Um, so if we don't get the deep quality of sleep, again, it could lead to cognitive or memory decline and Alzheimer's disease. So um, we can't do anything about aging, but we can definitely do um, something about following the, the suggestions that are at the end of this presentation and trying to get a better quality of sleep. Do you think that sleep quality can affect our DNA, our genes? What do you think? I've never yes. thought about that. Yeah, I didn't think about it either. But the amount of quality of sleep can affect our DNA. Um, they did a study in, in a group of healthy adults and some were asked to sleep six hours a night. Well, most of them, they normally slept eight, but they asked them to only sleep six. And so then they studied their pre and post uh, gene activity. 711 genes in the group had genetic activity distortion or change in their genes. Half of the genes were increased in their activity and half were decreased. So the genes that switched off were those that strengthened the immune system. Uh-oh. So their immune system was decreased, right? But the genes that were switched on were those that affect the promotion of tumors, chronic inflammation, stress, and cardiovascular disease. So 711 genes 
just in going from eight hours of sleep a night down to six hours of sleep, 711 genes were affected and they were affected. Then the ones that were turned on, the ones that were turned off, it, they were both for negative reasons. So again, you know, we're, we're exposing ourselves to disease and decreasing our immune system. I thought that was a really interesting study because I didn't think that the, the type of sleep that we had and the amount actually affected our genes, but, but it does. So that was interesting. Does our diet affect our sleep quality? What do you, what do you think? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. For sure. So timing yes. is important. What happens if we eat a large meal at night? Do we sleep well? Nope. No, it forces our body, you know, our whole body wants to rest. Our stomach wants to rest just like our muscles do and our brain does. So if we eat too much at night, it forces the body to try to digest food. And it doesn't really do a good job. We have our hottest and our fastest metabolism in the morning. And so what's not digested at night, it becomes fermented and it goes into the system and it's, um, it's inflammatory. So it's good to have a light meal at night. Uh, light soup, fruit, or bread. If we have diabetes, we want to add a little protein so we can have some peanut butter on the bread or a little bit of low-fat cheese, something like that. Something light at night and then try to eat at least three to four hours before bedtime. Give your body a chance to digest that light meal. Like I said, if we eat pizza, our stomach will be trying to get back at us through the night. We'll have wild dreams. <laughs> How about hydration? <clears throat> Does that affect our sleep? I didn't think about that either, but yes, it does. Because uh, at night we lose our moisture. And if we go to sleep dehydrated, that can cause our dry mouth. It can cause us to snore. It could cause a headache from lack of, of water in our body. And it could cause muscle cramping. And these all can interfere with sleep. Uh, the morning is our most dehydrated time of the day. And if you heard any of the cardiologists speak, they'll say, make sure to drink some water before you get out of bed because your heart needs that. And we want to drink adequate more uh, water in the morning and through the day. How much water do we need? What do you remember from our last talks? How much water? Is it like a gallon? Divide the weight in half. And that's how many ounces we need through the day. So if we weigh 200 pounds we would need 100 ounces of water. And then we want to take that water and divide by four. So you want about a fourth of that water when you wake up. So if we're, if we're aiming for 100 ounces, if we weigh 200 pounds, we want about 25 ounces when we wake up. And then uh, another fourth of the water, about one and a half to two hours after each meal. If you're drinking 25 ounces of water after supper, and that keeps you up at night, we can have, you know, a little bit more early in the day. But that's the right amount of water, and that does not include you know, anything else we drink. So that's our water goal, unless you're, unless you're on a water restriction. So any questions about how much water we should be drinking? Does everybody drink half their weight in water? Nope. No, ma'am. <laughs> well, that's a good goal for us. And it can actually help our sleep to be better because we will be so dehydrated at night and have all of these, have these issues. Okay. Nancy says she drinks a lot of water. Nancy? Yes, she was in the chat. She said she drinks a lot. Good, good. Okay. So this is, um, so this kind of refers to what you were talking about a little bit earlier, Natalie, just thinking about stuff. So we like to call it the chat room. So what's the chat room? Well, we just chat with ourselves and we have we, we, we worry about things and we try to solve problems and our mind wanders. That's the chat room. So we need to get out of the chat room and that way it might make it a little bit easier for us to go to sleep. So how can you get out of the chat room? Well, you know, you can think about things that are calming you can listen to soft and calming songs, count backwards or read a non-stimulating material. Definitely don't want to read any murder mysteries when you can't go to sleep. Um, recite information from memory. So um, long passages that you've memorized, you can try to go through those and it'll put you to sleep. 
and then pull back your thoughts when they want to wander back into the chat room. So you start worrying about something, just go right to train your mind to just go right to the things that are common and keep you from, you know, wandering and get out of that chat room. Okay. I like that term chat room. So which medications can affect our sleep? Um, so these would include Cipro and I took Cipro one time and I had the wildest dreams, kept me up all night. So I, I'm a personal, uh, <laughs> personal, have a personal experience with that. Floxin, prednisone, theophylline, which is prescribed for asthma and breathing problems, and then antihistamines. So these are some types of things that can affect our sleep. And even if we can sleep, a lot of times it doesn't give us that deep sleep that we need. <clears throat> So here's the nitty gritty. So how can we go ahead and um, get the quality of and quantity of sleep that we need? We want to stay off our cell phone. How many of us put our cell phone right by the bed and it's, you know, almost bedtime or bedtime and we think, I wonder if anybody has texted me or messaged me. I wonder what's going on on Facebook. And we pick up that cell phone and we go ahead and we're exposed to that blue light. Okay. So, and also the electromagnetic frequency. So that EMF, those frequencies can affect your sleep. They can hurt your brain if the phone is too close to your head. If you, the best thing is to keep it out of the bedroom. I use mine as an alarm clock. So I just put my phone on airplane mode, which decreases the um, EMF somewhat. But the main thing with the cell phone, with iPads, with tablets, with computers, and with televisions, not so much a television because we're far away from it, but all the other electronics, um, these have blue light. And blue light is good when we're utilizing it through the day, but electronic blue light is a little bit of a different frequency from the blue light from the sun. So if we look at our screens <clears throat> when it's dark, this tells our brain, oh, it's time to wake up. And so it, it wakes up our brain and then it's hard for us to calm the brain back down, convince the brain, you know, we turn off the light or some people, they might have a blue light in their room all night. Like if we leave the television on, that's a blue light, especially with noise and the, the flashing of the, as the scene changes on the phone, um, that blue light says to the brain, wake up. So we do not want to expose our brain to blue light at least an hour before we go to bed. So any question about that? That's extremely important. No blue light an hour before bedtime. So we want to sleep in complete darkness and quiet, but we can use a white noise because that's not going to lead our brain to try to think about what it is. Like if we, if we had TV on, we'd be listening to, to the conversation and our brain would be wandering. We can read something soothing with a soft light on, take a relaxing shower or bath, listen to soft music, not syncopated, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Um, avoid stressful or exciting things and keep it cool. Our body temperature needs to drop its core temperature um, in order to go to sleep and stay asleep. So 65 degrees is a great uh, temperature to set the, the thermostat. And then we want to go to sleep and wake up at the same time each day, including the weekends. And that keeps us on a regular circadian rhythm. If we can sleep with the windows open, I don't know a whole lot of people that do that, especially in the summer when there's a lot of humidity, but if you can, that's a good practice. And the other very important thing is to get some morning sunshine every day because the morning sunshine goes through the eyes and hits the pineal gland. And that lets the pineal gland know to manufacture those hormones. It doesn't release the hormones until those times that we talked about but the pineal gland will manufacture those hormones. They'll stay in the pineal gland. And then when we go to bed on time, the right amount of those hormones will be released. So it's very important to get um, that morning sunshine every day. The first hour of sunlight in the day is the most important for keeping us regulated. And one of the speakers in the references that I spoke about, they do a lot of travel by plane. And they said they just reset, they reduced their jet lag by getting out in the morning 
of the place that they went to, they close their eyes, they look at the sun with their eyes closed, and that sunlight resets their circadian rhythm and they don't suffer as much from jet lag. So morning sun is, is very important. Caffeine and refined sugar can stimulate the mind and inhibit learning retention up to 50%. So students that are studying for tests, they drink caffeine all night, they eat sugary foods, and they're taking it in, but it's not being retained. As we get older, caffeine affects us even more. One serving of caffeine will affect our brain and our ability to get good sleep for up to two days, just one cup of coffee, because the half-life of caffeine is about four hours. So if we drink 100 milligrams, then we're having a lot of caffeine still in our system. Nicotine and excessive amounts of chocolate can stimulate the brain as well, so we don't want to dig into the Dove bag right before bedtime. <laughs> Been guilty of that sometimes. Um, if we avoid stimulants and go to bed early, they uh, then we can retain that learned information much better and avoid naps during the day. I would say maybe with an elderly person that can't sleep, you know, at night, they might be able to, uh, and they can go to sleep on time, they might be able to get away with a nap. <clears throat> Healing happens at twice the rate when we're sleeping. So if we are suffering from um, the cold or flu or some kind of infection, if we get the right amount of sleep at the right time, we're more likely to heal faster. If we're doing vigorous exercise, it's good to do that before eating in the morning. And also we might be getting um, some sunlight if we're doing our exercise outside. Take a walk after meals that relaxes us. It makes our muscles work, makes us more, makes it easier for us to go to sleep. And for people that do all of these things and still cannot go to sleep, there's something called bright light therapy. And uh, they have light therapy boxes and they can produce 2,000 to 10,000 lux. And they situate them over the bed. And so what the light does, it starts, it starts turning on um, at a certain time every day. And so it mimics the sun in your brain. So it turns on very slowly. So it's almost like the sun is rising when that light gradually increases and it wakes you up with light, but it also resets your brain, your circadian rhythm. So that way the pineal gland can make those hormones and the person would be able to go to sleep a little bit more easily at night. So there are some light boxes um, on Neil Nedley's website and that's in one of the references. So we always want to keep a thankful mind. A lot of times having a thankful mind, if we just go through the things that we're thankful for, that keeps us out of the chat room. We want to try to avoid negative thinking. Thank God for his blessings. Happiness is a choice and not dependent on things. And we can pray or meditate and count our blessings. Sometimes people take uh, melatonin. Uh, it can be used, but uh, it's recommended to not use melatonin every night because as we take it every night, our body just tends to make less of our own melatonin. So we can use it every once in a while, but it shouldn't be used every night. Um, we can drink uh, some tea with the herbs valerian, lavender, and chamomile. Those are all sleep-inducing tea, uh, teas, but you might wanna check with a provider or the PharmD, especially with valerian, you don't wanna take that with an antidepressant. If you're tossing and turning and cannot sleep, get up and go into another room. Even though you try to get out of the chat room, it doesn't work. Read a book with a soft light and wait till you're sleepy. And that that reinforces the bed sleep connection. Because if you're laying in bed for hours and hours and hours, your brain says, well, you know, I'm in bed, but it's not helping. But if you get up and you read with a soft light, then you get sleepy. Then you can go back to bed and the brain says, okay, I'm in bed. So that's, I need to sleep now you're connecting bed with sleep and that's all i have so um any questions i have a question for berta okay um it, you're saying that we need to get um six to eight hours of sleep a night correct eight hours okay yeah. is that continuous that would be optimal um, and so if we go through these best practices and we still can't get six, I mean, eight hours, but we're able to take a short nap through the day, 
um, sometimes that helps a lot. Um, but if we can try to try to go through the best practices and get eight hours. Well, the reason I'm asking is because I usually go to bed at 1030 and then I'm up like 130. OK. And then I usually I'm up for an hour. No matter what I do, I, I'm up for that hour Okay. and then and then go back to bed and then try to catch the rest of my disease. So, so what, what would that count? What wakes what, you what, up? What, what wakes you in, up? Sometimes it's my feet hurt. Sometimes I'm hot. Sometimes it's nothing. It's just I'm awake. And it's almost like it's getting to be a pattern. Okay. Well, go down the checklist of what's on the on the PowerPoint here and say, okay, did I get any blue light before I went to sleep? So um, if you don't, if you don't get any blue light, if you do some relaxing things before you go to bed, you eat a light meal and you're not eating a heavy meal before you go to sleep, uh, making sure that you're sleeping in darkness, maybe use some uh, some uh, white noise. Make sure in the morning when you get up, you get that early morning sun. If you go down that checklist, avoiding caffeine, avoiding chocolate, especially you know after afternoon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you go down that check checklist, sometimes that helps. But if not, if you if you're sleeping three hours, you're awake for an hour and a half, and then you're sleeping maybe five hours after that. You know, it's not as best, not as good as eight continuous hours, but better than you know having less than eight hours. I okay. hope that I hope that answered your question. <laughs> you did. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Was this helpful for you? Yes. Okay. So that's the that's the idea to give folks information on how to, you know, sleep well. And you can look up the references and read more about that. Neil Nedley in his Depression the Way Outlook has a lot of great um, ideas on sleeping. You know, I just summarized them here, but he goes into a little bit more detail. That was really good. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for, for joining us. And I hope it helped. And like Natalie said, the, um, the information will be on online. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. You're most welcome. Wonderful. I've, get, um, I've got some information in the chat again with folks appreciating the presentation. Sandy would like to know if we can get a printable of, the, of your presentation, Roberta. I can send it to you and then you can distribute it if you like. All right, I will do that. So everyone who is registered for the day, once I get that from Roberta, I will email that out to you. And as Roberta mentioned, I will also um, upload the link to this presentation. I know we had at least one coming near the end, but this will be posted later. Uh, I think it usually takes the <clears throat> marketing guy maybe uh, a few, I'm going to say a week at the most mm. to uh, edit the presentation and then get me a link back. So as soon as I get that, I will email it to you and post it also in the Facebook group, Living with D2. If you are not a member of our Facebook group, feel free to look us up and join. I usually post the uh, meeting links there as well as sending them on email and then also send out um uh, just beneficial information about sleep, about food, uh, about anything dealing with diabetes. You can ask questions also. Um, sometimes Roberta pops in there. She may be able to answer a question or two. Um, the name of the group is Living with D2. The and Natalie, two. Natalie's posts are awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I, oddly enough, I find my best post in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, that's your creative REM time. That's right. Yes, it is. It really is. And I also just want to remind everyone um, of our meetings for next month. We will have three in-person meetings. We will be meeting November 15th at Lexington Family Practice on Powell Drive. That's going to be a potluck, and everyone is asked to bring their favorite healthy holiday dish with the recipe so we can share with the group. Also, on Thursday, November 16th, uh, we will be meeting at Mount Tabor Lutheran Church in West Columbia. 
Our guest speaker there will be Kay McKinnis, and this will be a hands-on cooking experience. And then on Monday, November 20th, we will be meeting at Pisgah Lutheran Church here in Lexington, South Carolina, out past Lexington High School. And your guest speaker will be me, Natalie, with Flavored Fork. And this will also be a potluck. And again, everyone is asked to bring their favorite healthy holiday dish with the recipe to share with the group. Uh, you could attend one, two, or all three of these presentations. Um, the link will be coming out sometime soon after this presentation, maybe within the next day or so. So be on the lookout for that. Um, since you're on the email distribution list, you will be getting um, the link before everyone else. So be on the lookout. And I see Nat uh, Nancy has joined the Facebook group. Thank you, Nancy. Feel free to share that link with anyone that you know who is uh, dealing with type 2 diabetes or their caregivers. We want to help as many folks as we can. Awesome. Any awesome. additional questions or comments, Roberta? No, I just appreciate everybody's time and I hope this helps you sleep because um, definitely our sleep definitely affects our health and our diabetes. Yeah. Yes. Awesome presentation as always, Roberta. I look forward to getting the copy of the presentation from you so that I can share it with those who registered. And to the rest of you, hope you have a good night and be on the lookout for the link for the November's meeting. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.